I am super, super gracious that I ever made it this far and that 5,000 of you follow me on here, which is crazy. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if you guys are new. Welcome back to another Real Talk series. I wanted to make this video a little bit different than my normal Real Talk series and I'm actually going to be doing my makeup at the same time. I usually get distracted by trying to tell you guys what I'm using while I'm talking about things. So all the products I will be using on my face, I will be linking in the description bar down below. So anyways, let's go ahead and get onto it here. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and put my hair up in my usual get up. Also, I just dyed my hair in case you guys didn't know. That's why it looks super great. I cannot curl it this well for some reason, but my stylist did a really excellent job. We just brought down my root color a little bit more because I felt like the blonde going all the way up to the roots was kind of intense and I kind of missed having my natural hair color up there a little bit more. I brought you guys in a little bit closer because even though the makeup isn't the focus of this video, I just wanted to let you guys see what I was doing a little bit closer because I am doing that like fox eye kind of look on myself. The first thing that I wanted to kind of cover is the issue of timing. Everybody always has this obsession with wanting to get faster as a makeup artist, steps to kind of like speed up the makeup application or what steps they can cut out to make their application time quicker. I know this is a main concern with all newer makeup artists because as we all know, when we first begin at makeup, we're never quick at it. I believe that I took about an hour and a half per face when I first started with makeup. It's not like I automatically just jumped in and could bust out a full face in 30 minutes. That's not how it works. I feel like people just think about it as in like the more people they can take, the more money they're gonna make. But that's kind of a backwards mentality to look at things. And I know that realistically, you're going to think about it that way because obviously you you are in business for yourself and you need to make money to survive. I get it. But you really want to concentrate on also providing quality for your clients too. And you kind of have to have a happy balance. I take about 40 to 45 minutes on a bridal application because I feel like that is a ideal time frame for me to be able to get my job done, do it well, correct anything that needs to be corrected. And then that also includes my cleanup time in between each person. I just truly feel like if I did an application in less than 35 minutes, my work would look so bad. I think it would look like a shit show. My liner probably wouldn't be straight. If I did a bold lipstick, it would be lined super crooked. I just feel like my work would start being compromised if I did it any quicker. And that's what you guys really have to realize. It's not all about being quick sometimes. It's about the quality and the level of, I guess, work that you're putting out after a while. You don't want to be so quick to the point where your work starts being compromised. Everybody's always just focused on trying to get faster and trying to improve their time, but it's like after a certain point in time, you really just have to kind of give it up. Brides, it's all about the experience. It's their wedding day. They want to get pampered. If you work too quickly, as in like 30 minutes or less, you're not giving your bride the full experience. And they probably may not feel like they're getting the same level of experience as they would if you were taking 45 minutes or something like that, because you might be feeling rushed the whole time, or you might be cutting out steps to get it done. Also, you can't really justify charging a higher price if you take that short amount of time. For instance, you can't be charging like upwards of $100 per application if you're only taking 20 minutes per person because they're not getting the full experience and that's just a money grab at that point in time. So you really just need to know when to actually stop trying to get quicker and more so try to just improve your level of quality. The only time I feel like this would ever be like acceptable would be if you're on a film and television set. The directors are usually like, you need to get it done, get it done quickly. You usually throw on very minimal products. You throw on a bunch of cream products, but then you're also there to touch up throughout the day. So it's not as detrimental to have stuff be long lasting. But if you're doing a bride, I at least think to make it worth their money and worth their time to hire you anywhere between 35 to an hour, I feel like for a bride is like a pretty happy medium. And also I've seen some people take longer. I've seen some people take a shorter amount of time than that. But I will let you know that the people that spend time actually doing a thorough job and take a little bit longer at their applications usually turns out a little bit better. And it could go down just to like technicalities at that point in time. Like, is your wing liner sharp enough? Is your lip line correctly? Is your eyeshadow blended out thoroughly? Like it just comes down to very, very minuscule technical things at that point in time. And they're not paying for everyday makeup. They're paying for bridal makeup. They're paying for long lasting makeup. They're paying for your knowledge and expertise at that makeup application. So keep in mind, even though being quick is nice, sometimes if you're too
too quick, it can almost start to work against you. Going along with brides and bookings and everything, I wanted to talk about brides not being honest in their trials. There's a ton of people that have come to me recently. They're basically asking me why a bride isn't booking them after they do their bridal trial. They always said that they loved it and wouldn't change anything. And then they end up not booking them or fixing stuff later throughout the day. I just want people to realize brides 100% will not tell you the truth. People are super afraid of hurting other people's feelings. Even if you literally tell them to be 100% honest with you, people are just so afraid of hurting your feelings or making corrections to their look, thinking that it's going to offend you somehow, even though that's literally what the trials are there for, is making changes. We as artists want the best for them. We want them to have their ideal bridal look. They don't tell us something, we can't make corrections. A lot of the times though, if brides are super afraid to say something and they don't like something, they will just not end up booking with you or not even give you a second chance to like redeem yourself or anything. Like it just literally ends there. So then you pretty much are losing out on that booking just because that bride wasn't honest with you that they didn't like something. So a lot of the times it is not your fault if a bride ends up changing something or if they just don't end up booking you after the bridal trial. I will definitely let my brides know that they need to tell me if they don't like something and to be totally honest and that I won't be offended about it. But a lot of times brides still don't tell you stuff. Like they still are not honest with you for some reason and it's really weird. Maybe it's just because I am a makeup artist and I know this, but if I went to another makeup artist for my wedding day and it wasn't 100% correct, I would for sure be nitpicking. So yeah, unless you as an artist just feel like you thoroughly messed up that application or something or know you did something wrong, then I don't really think it's something that's your fault. And of course, I know that as artists, whenever somebody doesn't like your work or they tell you to fix something, you kind of get like a little pit in your stomach, but it's a little bit better knowing that than not having that bride book with you and then never knowing why they didn't book with you. It's just kind of like a mystery that never wraps up in our heads. Unfortunately, there is nothing you really can do to prevent this. I don't know, it's just is what it is. It's so weird. The next topic that I wanted to cover that you're probably not going to be able to control either is clients ghosting you. This basically means that you're sending emails to them or responding to their emails and they're not responding to you. It usually happens after you tell them your prices. I was getting a ton of people that would literally reach out to me as an inquiry and then ask me about my prices. I would tell them my prices and then they would just never get back to me. It was out of their budget, which is completely understandable. I get it. I know that my prices are not gonna fit everybody's budget, but I'm also not lowering it to fit somebody's budget. Never do that, by the way. You'll find that bride that really wants to book with you and pay your prices. But anyways, I truly felt like I was getting a ton of people that just ghosted me or didn't respond after I took the time and responded to their emails and everything and then I would just never hear back. Then of course as a vendor you want to follow up with somebody a couple of weeks afterwards but then even sometimes then they weren't responding to me either and I was like oh my gosh I was like what is this? Instead of just responding back and be like hey I want another direction they would just not respond to me. I just don't understand first follow where people's common courtesies go anymore. The majority of time people ghost you honestly though is either A about pricing so if you have too high of a price tag and it doesn't fit their budget or if your travel fee is too high. I've had that recently. Or if you maybe didn't respond back fast enough or something and they ended up booking another vendor, they probably also will ghost you too because they don't need you anymore. I usually respond back to my brides within 24 hours. So I do not have that problem. So you're not gonna avoid it completely. People are literally just inconsiderate and won't respond back to you. That's what it is this day and age. But I have significantly decreased the amount of people that have ghosted me because I started listing my prices publicly on my website. If you have them publicly on your website already, then it pretty much eliminates a reason why somebody wouldn't want to book with you. Do you know what I mean? When I first got started, I did not publicly list my prices on my website because I felt like by having people have to reach out to me for the prices that I would somehow convince them to book with me even if it wasn't in their budget. Realistically, if you're not in their budget, you're not in their budget. Like there's no convincing them really otherwise. So not only was it a waste of my time, but it was also a waste of their time too. So by listing your prices on your website, I know it might seem weird. Please do it. It will save you a lot of headache. So normally about every single person now that reaches out to me is okay with my prices. Nine times out of 10, they're just automatically going to be booking with me. Also, the majority of brides will not even reach out to you if you don't publicly put your prices on your website 
website because they don't want to do the effort. Try to make it as easy for them as possible when they're shopping around for vendors and just list your prices on your website. Okay, the next thing that I wanted to cover is over kit downsizing. And you guys are probably going to think that this is a really weird topic that I'm actually complaining about because all I preach on this channel is about kit downsizing, how you need to minimize your stuff and put it into plastic containers so it's not so heavy. So you guys are probably going to think like, what do I have to complain about, right? When you first start out as an artist, you need to learn how to work with a multitude of products and learn how to mix things. When you're downsizing your kit so much, it almost is counterproductive to newer artists. You need to actually be able to just learn how certain things work on different skin tones and different ages and everything. And you need to have a variety of products to learn from. Some people are downsizing to the point where they can't even work efficiently with their kit because they don't have that many shades to work with. As a newer artist, it's just more so about focusing on techniques rather than focusing on your makeup kit. Nowadays, since everybody's obsessed with makeup kits and everybody has the what's in my makeup kit freelance tour, I feel like everybody's just so obsessed with buying stuff in their kit and organizing their kit and everything. And then everybody thinks that if you have a good organized kit, then it makes you a good makeup artist. Yeah, you'll work a lot more efficiently, but if you don't know how to work with the colors that you already have in your kit and you condense it so much to the point that you can't find anything or you can't work with it efficiently because you're not sure even what color that is, then it's a little bit harder to learn as an artist. I just want to let you guys know that especially as a newer artist, your makeup kit does not make you a good artist. It's yourself that makes you the good artist. It's your techniques, it's your skill set, it's your experience. Any experienced makeup artist that is actually good at their job can make stuff from the Dollar Tree work on a client and make it look like it is a thousand dollar makeup application. Yes, obviously products do have something to do with it because you know you get higher quality products that perform a little bit better or just make it easier. But as an experienced artist, you could technically make stuff from the Dollar Tree work if you absolutely had to. I, no joke, started out with a very minimal amount of products in my kit and did not have like a full thing like I do now. I did just fine. I didn't have any issues. I know a bunch of people have commented on my YouTube channels that, you know, once they get their makeup kit together, then they can launch their business. I, no joke, launched my business without even having a full makeup kit. And I kind of just use things from my own personal collection that you could sanitize like powders and whatnot. I had to buy new foundations for my kit. I had to buy new concealers for my kit. So buy the things for your kit that you know you can't sanitize. For instance, mascaras, lip glosses, lipsticks, you can't sanitize. If you guys haven't checked out how to sanitize your makeup kit, by the way, I'll link it up above. But otherwise than that, don't waste your money on trying to buy any sort of powder products. For instance, like blushes or bronzers, especially like eyeshadow palettes. And you have enough that can work on all the skin tones that you might have in your chair. Just spray everything down with 70% alcohol and sanitize sanitize it to its absolute max capacity and then use it in your kit for a while until you get enough clients to make money and then you can start upgrading your kit. It does not have to be anything fancy or all high end when you first begin. Like I legitimately use my own blushes. I use my own bronzers. I use all my own eyeshadow palettes for a really freaking long amount of time. It honestly took about a year for me being a freelancer and being actively working for me to be able to afford all the stuff that I have. I don't use anything from my kit in my personal stash and vice versa. So just keep in mind that you do not have to have a absolute absolutely perfect kit or all high-end kit when you begin. You can use your own stuff, just sanitize it. Don't use the things that you can't hygienically sanitize. You just need to kind of go out there and get experience more so. It's really all about experience. Most people are just focused on just doing research and YouTube and everything, which I completely understand. You definitely want to get your research and get some sort of knowledge before you just start as a makeup artist. But I think that it's wise for every single person that is a self-taught makeup artist that has not gone to school for it or anything to get some sort of actual education and not just, you know, try to learn off of YouTube. You need hands-on experience. You need to have a real world experience rather than just a digital one, if that makes sense. I, of course, worked for MAC for about three or four years. When I was working at MAC, I trained with a couple of different makeup artists that did fashion shows and runway shows and everything and were very big time makeup artists. They were my trainer and taught my group how to do makeup applications, what techniques work for different eye shapes and then how to match skin tones, how to apply false lashes, things like that. We all got hands-on experience because we were all doing it on each other. And then we switched models every once in a while. That is exactly why I went for a cosmetic company. You guys can go that route. I also think that just taking an actual like certification course is a really beneficial thing to do. Of course, as a lot of you guys know, 
I took the online makeup academy course. I can link the video that I posted up above telling you guys about the course and everything. And you guys can also use my discount code in the description bar if you guys wanna sign up and get $100 off the course. For the makeup, you do need to have makeup done on an actual model. And that helps you obviously diversify and get more experience doing different ages, different skin tones. I honestly got the most training that I ever did from working at MAC. And if I hadn't worked at MAC, I honestly probably would not be anywhere at the level where I am right now. Honestly, hands-on training gave me the most experience ever. As a makeup artist, it's all about doing and not necessarily just seeing things. As many times as somebody shows you something or how to do something, you need to be applying it physically yourself. And I know a bunch of people are super intimidated by this, but just start out with family and friends. I still have model calls every once in a while, or if I have new products I add to my kit, I don't wanna use it on paying clients first. Or if I have new techniques that I wanna try out, I'll completely give away makeup applications for free, get models over at my house, and we'll just play around with makeup. Like that's pretty much what happens, but I do that every once in a while just to kind of keep my portfolio up. And that does still happen even if you are an experienced makeup artist, but definitely just get some sort of hands-on experience. The next topic I want to talk about here is one that I feel like doesn't get talked about that often, but that is about diversifying your income. So as we all know, it's super hard to be in this industry sometimes because your income is very hit or miss. Like there's some months where you're just raking it in during bridal season or something like that. But then in other seasons where it's your off season, you might as well just be living in a cardboard box because you're super broke. Account for the times where you are going to be super slow like that and you kind of need to learn how to save money and not, you know, spend all your money whenever, you know, you're making like $4,000 a month or something. Not going to be like that all the time because sometimes you're only going to be making like $200 a month. And also being in business for yourself, you may not know how long your business is going to go on for. We might also have another COVID shutdown, you never know. Like people did not predict COVID at all. So what I mean by diversifying income is not putting all your eggs in one basket. And this is more so for people that definitely want to go full-time with makeup artistry and want to do this as a long-term career. You need to diversify your income and have multiple streams of income. Makeup artists do run online classes sometimes or they do master classes in person. But makeup artists having those master classes, that is another way that they are diversifying their income because obviously it's an additional income stream for them. This is going to sound really harsh, but I feel like if you don't have an entrepreneurial forward-thinking mindset, you're not going to make it in this industry. Like you need to be a forward thinker. You need to be innovative. That's why the majority of time when you see makeup artists doing these master classes or makeup lessons or something, that is what they're doing. It's a fallback for them. It's smart in this day and age though to have one of your sources of income be something digital or online. We just are trying to avoid as much contact with other human beings as we possibly can. So that's why having virtual online lessons is a really good thing. I know that a bunch of people have asked me if I would ever do that, but I don't know if I ever would. <laughs> First of all, I would have to find time to bring in models. And I feel like I would only have time to do this if I was only doing makeup artistry full time. I had to host makeup lessons for individuals when I worked for Mac and I did not like doing it. But I also feel like it's maybe just because I was teaching people that do not know how to do makeup at all or have any concept of techniques as opposed to teaching another makeup artist how to do makeup. Maybe I could be okay with doing that with other makeup artists and I would just host like virtual classes. I don't know if that would be something that you guys would be interested it in so leave that in the comments down below let me do my lower lash line awkwardly and do the weird mascara face that everybody does that is what i'm gonna do for my eyes i think i kind of just wanted to share with you guys my streams of income i know that you guys probably already can guess what all of them are i have five different streams of income in case you guys are wondering but again as a makeup artist please make sure you at least have two different streams of income because in case your makeup artistry business is slow or if it doesn't do so well one year, have something to fall back on. I know that some people have definitely made it with only having one source of income, but they've struggled in certain times. As far as my streams of income go, I'm never going to tell you guys how much I actually make per year altogether because I don't feel like anybody actually needs to know that except for me and my husband. I'm gonna go by, I guess, the biggest source of income all the way to the lowest source of income. So as you guys all know, I have a full-time job. That one's slightly makes me more than my makeup artist career, but they're pretty tied right now. But I'll still put my actual full-time job first just because it's 
it's a set income that I have and I already know how much I make from it. And then makeup artist income is definitely the second one. Again, very close tie to second. Makeup artist income is almost trumping the full-time income now. After that, I have my YouTube income. Then after that, I have affiliate links. So that is anything in my description bar. If I mention a product or tell you about it, normally all the links in my description bars are affiliate links. So that's through Amazon. And I also now have affiliate links through Magic Links. Then of course, the fifth source that I have is from my Shop Julie Ruby business templates where I sell bridal contracts, accounting templates, and also consultation templates. And then of course, I do have two other things that I'm trying to develop as my sixth and seventh stream of income, <laughs> which is hopefully the makeup lesson someday. Then I think I'm just going in with a really neutral lip liner all over my lips. But yeah, isn't that like the perfect color? So I usually do that. And then I have been just putting a gloss over top. And I'm actually going to use the sparkly one that I have not used in a really long time. I got this in a BoxyCharm box. Comment down below if you guys were here for my BoxyCharm unboxings. Deleted those off my channel. Well, I'm officially done with my makeup, but I still wanted to talk about one more topic. So just hang tight with me. So I have not told my full-time job this yet, but I am going to be quitting my full-time job sometime this year. I kind of want to do it before August. I have to get my job probably about a couple of months heads up because I want them to be able to find somebody to replace me. I'm the only one in my office that can do the job that I can do. I'm going to either A, have to train one of the bosses to do my job or B, they're just going to have to bring in the accountant like they did before to do my job. I just am so, so unhappy with the job that I'm doing right now. It isn't even about the money anymore, guys, because I know I can make it financially. I mean, I can, but it still freaks me out at the same time. It's about me just doing it and getting in there. Just like you guys are afraid to launch your makeup artistry businesses because you're afraid it's gonna fail. And I'm the same way, but with this. <laughs> Like, I just am afraid that I'm not gonna be able to make ends meet or it's going to fail. I'm literally letting go of the only stable income that I have right now. It's very nerve wracking because I am such a type A person. Like, I need to plan things. I need to have a second backup plan for things. Here's the issue right now that I'm having. I am literally spending so much time at my office, obviously for eight hours a day for four days a week, right? I don't work on Fridays, which is let me do other things, which is great. Eight hours of the day is so long to just have time be wasted that you're not doing anything. I'm also such a quick worker that I usually get my job done Monday and Tuesday and then pretty much have the afternoon of Wednesday and then all day Thursday not doing anything. At that time, I could literally be spending doing makeup or I could be editing videos or even filming videos. So at this point in time, it's mostly about me not wasting my time and being more efficient with it. I would just leave my full-time job. I would have so many other opportunities to grow in my business and also grow on YouTube as well. I could start picking up jobs during the week that I have to turn down because I work at my full-time job. And that would literally make up for me working at my full-time job. I know a bunch of you guys though that have gone through the same thing as me are literally going to know what I'm going through right now and have felt the same thing I have felt at one point in time and know the struggle of it. It's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> to be totally honest, YouTube honestly takes up the majority of my time. It takes up more time editing videos than I do during my makeup artist career. And I don't even get compensated a lot for YouTube videos. I just do it because I want to inform you guys about stuff and I have fun personally doing it. YouTube isn't about the money for me. But of course, if I'm going to be doing this as my actual full-time career, eventually I want to be able to make enough off of YouTube to make it worth it. I definitely don't want to have to quit YouTube, but if it ever comes to it and I need to have my priorities be elsewhere. I just want you guys to know that I am super, super gracious that I ever made it this far and that 5,000 of you follow me on here, which is crazy. I just don't thank you guys enough for all the love and support that you show me every single day. I always get really supportive DMs on Instagram and really supportive messages on YouTube. And I'm just super, super grateful for. I just want you guys to know that. I'm gonna sign off here before I get super emotional about this. <laughs> so anyways, um, hopefully you guys enjoyed this really long Real Talk series and kind of enjoyed me doing my makeup while I was doing this just to be a little bit more entertaining. But anyways, if you guys did enjoy this and want more of the Real Talk series, definitely go ahead and give this video a big thumbs up for me as well as also hitting that subscribe button if you have not already. As always, I hope you guys are having an absolutely fantastic day and I will talk to you guys in my next video. All right, bye.